give you a very warm welcome to our service this morning. Uh, we begin with the words of 1 Samuel 2 2. In Hannah's prayer, she declares, There is none holy like the Lord, for there is none like him. There is no rock like our God. And so he alone is holy, he is incomparable, and praise God, he is our rock, our only, the, the only source of trust that we have in this world, the unshakable one, even who we can turn to as our refuge and as our strength. And so let us praise him today in his holiness as we sing, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty. Let's stand as we sing this together, please. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come before you and acknowledge, Lord, that you are the Almighty God, the one who is holy, the one who is worthy of all our praise and worship. And Father, as this hymn has, has taken and given us a, a glimpse even of the heavenly throne room with cherubim and seraphim falling down before you, Lord, you are the everlasting God, the one who is enthroned forever. And Lord, you are incomparable. No one else is as mighty, as powerful, as majestic, as glorious as you. And so, Lord, we come before you to worship you. We pray today you'll give us a, a glimpse even of your glory, your majesty, your holiness. And Father, as we study your word, as we worship you also in song, Lord, may we not just sing these words out of routine, but may we just comprehend even of what we are singing. 
And Lord, so we marvel at even the great privilege that we can be united with Christ. And because of even our faith in Christ Jesus and that position even in Christ, Lord, we can approach you in prayer. Lord, in the midst of our own world with its, its own great power struggles, we remember, Lord, that you're the one who is ultimately in control. Lord, you have all authority. And we continue to remember even this situation in Ukraine and Russia. Father, we uh, give thanks that so many have been able to leave and even find refuge in other places. But we do pray for those who remain. We pray even for these talks that are continuing to happen as well. Father, we pray that even your hand would move even regarding that. We pray that some measure of peace would come to that land. And Father, we also pray for our own uh, UK government as well as they seek to appoint a new prime minister. Father, we ask that, Lord, whoever would be appointed, Lord, we will we'll, uh, continue to remember even the importance, Lord, of freedom of speech and freedom of speech not just for one group, but that this all would be afforded even this, this liberty. That, Father, we would have this liberty of freedom of speech and that our, ours would not be hindered, Lord, just because of what one other group would say. Father, we pray also about even how a number of bills even are awaiting um, just consideration by our government, very important bills even that have just implications even for the church as well. And, Father, we ask that whatever your outcome may be on these, Lord, that you would help us to be faithful to you and you would help the church even to remain faithful to your word. And Lord, we give thanks, Lord, that your word describes you as the rock, that in the midst of troubling times, we have a hope that endures. We know your love is steadfast, and Lord, that we can take that refuge in you, and that despite whatever we suffer even here in this world, Lord, we have a glorious hope, a hope that is not based on circumstances, but a hope that is based on you and your character. And so, Father, that hope does indeed endure. And we give you thanks for that. Help us, Lord, even as we seek to worship and honor and glorify you today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, hopefully as you've been uh, reading the announcements in the PowerPoint, uh, just as you come in, you'll have seen some of the things coming up. Uh, but just in case you haven't, let me draw your attention to two things. Uh, next week, Pastor Tom McLaughlin will be speaking on the morning service. And the reason for that is I'm actually going to be speaking in Malayal Baptist just in the morning. But next Sunday evening, uh, we're going to be in Newton Ards Baptist. And this is the first of our joint services. And then after that, they'll be happening every fortnight. So the first one, next Sunday night in Newton Ards Baptist. And that'll be taking place at it's the same usual time as ours, really, at 6.30. So 630 Newton Arts Baptist and Pastor Richard Donnan, uh, their, their new pastor there, will be actually taking that service as well too. So I would encourage you to attend that as well. Uh, don't forget also the uh, church bulletin's out at the back too. And something else, the Holiday Bible Club uh, publicity is out. Uh, the, the banner is on its way. It's had a little bit of a delay this week, but uh, we hope that will be up um, just on the, on the church. Uh, but we have some of these available okay, at the back. And what we would ask, if you are taking them to give out to people, please do tell us where you're giving them out because uh, our door-to-door -door team over this, uh, maybe next week, will be actually handing these out um, around various homes of maybe the children who've come before or other places where we know have children. So if you are taking them to give out in at your particular area, please have a word with either myself or Emma, just so we know not to do those houses twice. All right, but uh, these, there's a little permission slip in the back of them, which they do need to return to us um, as well too. But all the details are on that, so feel free to take some of these and give them out even to others who you know could, could come along. So the Holiday Bible Club, it's on on the 8th of August till the 12th of August, and that's from 10.30 to 12.30. And please do be praying for that. And I know Emma's making various plans and she'll be contacting some of the, the team as well uh, in the coming week. Do pray for Emma as uh, she's about to, to head off, not this week, but next on another CEF camp. So Emma's trying to get all the lessons ready for that as well too. So uh, a busy time at the moment, so please do uh, pray for. Well, these are all the announcements this morning. Well, we began by singing a hymn all about God's holiness, and now we move to a hymn which extols God's greatness his majesty, his splendor, and glorious trinity. So stay seated as we sing How Great is Our God. <laughs> The earth. 
earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God, sing with me how our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. Age to age He stands, and time is in His hands, beginning and the end, beginning and the end. Second Samuel chapter six. Second Samuel chapter six. And last week in our series in the life of David, we saw David being anointed king over Israel. Uh, before that, the, the the tribe of Judah had recognised him as as king, but now all of Israel recognises him as king. And we saw last week he faced two significant tests in the early years of his leadership. And the first was when he would take Jerusalem to be his capital. And we talked about even the great significance of that decision. And we saw then how there was another test of David's leadership when he led the people in in battle against the Philistines, not once, but in twi- twice, two occasions. And uh, the lesson we drew from that was the importance of depending on God. David could have done none of these things without depending on God. He inquired of the Lord even at each step of that journey. But if last week was about David's military maneuvers, then this week we learn more about David's religious responsibilities as king. And we see the measures that he took. But also we see this week a costly lesson is learnt. Let's read 2 Samuel chapter 6. David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with, them, went with all the people who were with him from Baal Judah to bring from there the ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, who sits enthroned on the cherubim. And they carried the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out to the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, were driving the new cart with the ark of God. And Ahio also went before the ark. 
And David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. And when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God struck him down there because of his error. And he died there because of the ark of God. And David was angry because the Lord had broken out against Uzzah. And that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. And David was afraid of the Lord that day. And he said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? So David was not willing to take the ark of the Lord into the city of David. But David took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. And the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. And it was told King David, the Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him because, the ark, because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. And when those who bore the ark of the Lord had gone six steps, he sacrificed an ox and a fattened animal. And David danced before the Lord with all his might. David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the horn. As the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, the daughter of Saul, looked out the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord. And she despised him in her heart. And they brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And when David finished offering the burnt offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts and distributed among all the people the whole multitude of Israel, both men and women, a cake of bread, a portion of meat, a cake of raisins to each one. Then all the people departed, each to his house. And David returned to bless the household. But Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How the king of Israel honored himself today uncovering himself today before the eyes of his servants and fe servants, female servants as one of the vulgar fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. And David said to Michael, it was before the Lord who chose me above your father and above all his house to appoint me as prince over Israel, the people of the Lord, and I will celebrate before the Lord. I will make myself more contemptible than this and I will be abased in your eyes. But by the female servants of whom you have spoken, by them I should be held in honor. And Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no child to the day of her death. And this is the word of God. We're going to sing now another hymn. We began with um, a hymn declaring God's holiness, and that's what our next hymn also does as well. This is Only a Holy God. Let's stand and sing this, if you're able to, please. Splendor of 
before we turn to God's word. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you, Lord, that no one can outshine your splendor, that no one else could rule with such justice, that your name is undefeated. What a privilege that we can see that you're not only the holy God, but that we can call you our God. Lord, help us even again as we move into another week. And we continue to remember even some of the ongoing ministries of our church as well. We do pray for the UCB prayer line ministry. Father, we pray that you help the team as, as they take these calls week to week. Lord, grant them wisdom even as to even what scriptures to read and, and what they would pray and the things that uh, they would say as, as others phone in. Lord, we pray that those who would phone in would be, would be helped, that they would even see you moving in their lives. Lord, we pray also for, for those who maybe phone into this service maybe sometimes and yet don't know you. We pray, Lord, that, that they would think of how they stand before you, the holy God, and that they would come to you through the way that you have provided through Christ Jesus. And Lord, we also, as we pray for the UCB ministry, also pray, Lord, even for our um, holiday Bible club as we seek to make arrangements for this. We pray for Emma as she also prepares even for CEF camp. Lord, we pray also even as we maybe even take even the invitations for the Holiday Bible Club. Lord, help us even as we do give them out to people. Give us those opportunities. And Lord, also pray for even those friends and extended family who were at that funeral that I took during the week. We pray for those who don't yet know you. We pray, Lord, even as they listen to that reminder of the frailty of life, but as they are reminded of the hope in the face of death. And I pray they would know Jim's Savior. Father, I pray, Lord, also for help for ourselves today as we turn to God's word. Lord, speak through this word to us today. Help us to see you, to clarify even our vision of you as the glorious holy God. So speak now in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Please turn to 2 Samuel 6, please. <coughs> 2 Samuel 6. You know, we've seen so far that David was clearly a gifted military leader. And in many ways, the passage last week was, was talking about that. And we've seen that as David headed off into to battle. You know, and we were reminded without God, David could do nothing. And even when faced with a second battle with the Philistines, he didn't just rely on the tactics of the previous time. 
David could have easily, after having a, a first successful encounter in battle, have just said, right, I'll do the same thing as the last time. But no, he inquires of the Lord each time. He depended on the Lord to give him the victory. But though David had established this important home for himself and a home for his, his people, this center uh, for his, his people, it was an important political home, but he didn't just want to make it the political seat of power because we see he wanted Jerusalem to be the rightful, almost like worship center of Jerusalem. He wanted them to, to turn back to the Lord. And so we see David's focus of that in this passage. And we see the very first thing, really. We're going to look at really three headings today. And the first one, really, is a significant decision in verses 1 to 4. David makes it a, a significant decision. And it was all concerning the Ark of the Covenant. Now, what was the Ark of the Covenant and, and why does it matter? Let's remind ourselves uh, initially, uh, just before we turn to some more of the verses, to see what was the Ark of the Covenant. We have a picture uh, of the Ark of the Covenant, uh, an artist's representation of it here. It was really a, a wooden chest overlaid with gold that contained the, the tablets of the um, Ten Commandments. And, and on top of the Ark was, was the mercy seat. And that was a solid piece of gold on top with two cherubim. And you see them on the top of it there. And the cherubim were, were really winged angels. And they, they, they're fixed to it. But the Ark of the Covenant was a really important symbol for God's people. It was actually very important it, because it symbolized God's presence with his people. Uh, verse 2, you see in the passage it's referred to as the Ark of God. It's called by the name of the Lord of hosts who sits enthroned in the cherubim. You see, the ark was regarded really as, as being like God's throne. Uh, you see, this was where God had said he would meet with his people. In Exodus 25, verse 22, uh, it says, there, there I will meet with you, and from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim who are on the ark of the testimony, I will speak with you about all that I will give you in commandment for the people of Israel. So this was the place that God would even meet with his, his servant Moses as well too. And, but throughout the, the books of Samuel, we see the ark moves around on a number of different occasions. Uh, in 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel 5, the Philistines capture the ark of God. But they quickly find out how that was a mistake. Because what happens, they quickly find out about the power of Israel's God. And in 1 Samuel 5, what you find is they bring it to the house of one of their idols, Dagon. And what happens the next morning, they find this great statue of Dagon toppled to the ground. And the head of Dagon is broken off. And the hands are broken off as well. And that was only the beginning of their troubles. The Philistines were quickly going to regret bringing the ark into their presence and capturing it because a plague then comes on the Philistines. And then they try and move the ark. And whenever they move the ark, well, that plague also comes to that next city as well. And so here God teaches the Philistines that he is not a God to be mocked. They end up returning the ark to this place called Kirith Jerem, also known as Baal Judah here, which we read about in, uh, in, in verse 2. So uh, the ark is then resides at this place for about 20 years, actually. During the reign of Saul, it remained there. Saul, it seems, had neglected the ark of the covenant. But David was determined to change that in his reign. He wants, the, he wants this symbol of God's presence to be once more among his people. See, the presence of God for David is a priority. And so he makes this very important and significant decision. Now, many people have wondered why David wanted the ark moved there in the first place. And commentators have written pages on this. And I've been reading through some of those pages during the week. Some suggested maybe David's attack on the Philistines last week in, in 2 Samuel 5. The fact that he took their idols after defeating them in battle. He took and destroyed their idols. And some think maybe that was why David then wanted the Ark of the Covenant moved, lest the Philistines try and do the same thing. I actually don't personally favor that opinion because I think to themselves, surely the Philistines would have learnt their lesson after the last time they took the Ark, after having these things befall on them. Um, but I think there's a more important reason, really, why David wants the Ark moved here. And what we see is this is a significant decision because it's the priority of God's presence. Dale Ralph Davis in his uh, little book on 2 Samuel, 
he gives three reasons really why the ark was so significant. And I want to just list these three reasons because if you're making notes, this is really important. You see, the ark speaks of God's rulership. It speaks of God's rulership because the ark was the symbol even of God's authority over his people. It's even on one occasion deemed as uh, this is like um, God's footstool, even here, the ark. Uh, That's what it's likened to in one verse as well too. So it's God's rulership. It symbolizes that, the fact that God was king over his people. God was the ultimate king. David was only really like the under shepherd. But the next thing, it's not only symbolizing the rulership, it symbolizes reconciliation. Because you see, what would happen in their their worship, in in the day of atonement, once a year, the high priest would sprinkle the blood of the sin offering upon the ark as well. So it symbolizes even reconciliation. So there's, there's rulership, reconciliation, but also it speaks of revelation. Because don't forget what was contained even within uh, the ark as well, uh, those, the, the law that God had given his people. But also um, here it says how this was the place where Moses even would have met with the children of Israel. He would have, have met, sorry, with, uh, when Moses met the Lord. He talked with the Lord here at the Ark of the Covenant. Exodus twenty five twenty two. The Lord also revealed even additional things to, to Moses there as he met him at the Ark. So it was he, there for, to even uh, to symbolize revelation. So rulership, reconciliation, and revelation. And David was taking the presence of God seriously. That's why he wanted the Ark there. And I'm more convinced with those reasons Definitely as to why David wanted to not only uh, bring God's presence and, and that symbol of God's presence back among his people, but also to restore the proper worship as well too. The fact that, as Dale Ralph Davis says, the majestic pardoning speaking God is in the midst of his people. David wanted that brought back in. And so he gathers chosen men of Israel, 30,000 in total, and they go to retrieve the ark. Verse 3 tells us how they transported it. They put it upon a new cart. And again, they probably thought that was a good and proper way for the ark to be treated. This was like um, maybe the equivalent of them transporting it on a, whatever was the Rolls Royce of the day. You know, their brand new, a, a brand new cart, a special cart. This wasn't just any old cart. This was a special one set aside. And so they think, well, well this is maybe a good way to do it. They think, So they bring it from Abinadab's house, where it had been all this time, and Uzzah and Ahio, his sons, they drive it. Ahio goes before it, uh, the oxen pulling it then from uh, from before the cart as well. So Ahio's maybe leading those oxen as the, the cart's being pulled along. Uzzah maybe following behind, just making sure that everything's okay. And what had seemed like this enthusiastic and noble endeavor from David is going to rapidly take a turn for the worse when something unimaginable happens. Because you see, what we see, the second thing is, there's an unforgettable lesson in God's holiness in verses 5 to 11. It must have been quite a scene, you see, these 30,000 people celebrating before the Lord. This was a, a wonderful moment. The ark, the very symbol of the presence of God coming back among his people, restoring even proper worship to what it should be. Musical instruments were played and there must have been a tremendous celebration. And yet when they reach the threshing floor of Nacon, the unthinkable happens. Because on the uneven ground, the oxen stumble and the ark begins to slide off the cart. And Uzzah does what he thinks best and he reaches out his hand to steady the ark. At which point we read these shocking words in verse 7. The anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah and God struck him down because of his error. And there he died before the ark of God. Imagine what that scene was like, this this joyous celebration. And as they see this happening, the faces are filled with horror. The music stops. The celebration turns to stunned silence and even mourning. It was a shocking moment and As we read it, I think it still shocks us today when we read this. You know, often uh, in in the past, maybe when you've read this passage, you maybe thought to yourself, you know, hold on a minute, this seems really unfair. Because what us is doing, well, surely is is us not doing a good thing by trying to, to keep the ark from falling. 
You know, the ark was such a sacred object, a symbol of God's presence. And, and, you know, maybe we think that because we put ourselves maybe in us's position and we ask ourselves if we were, you know, those people, how would we have reacted? Would we have done the same thing? Why does God strike him down like this? Is, is this too severe? But if we think this, we're, we're failing to see what's actually happening here because there's actually been a great offense before God. See, these men, um, and the offense wasn't just the reaching out of the hand. It actually began before this. They weren't handling or transporting the ark in the way that God had commanded. God had given, you see, very definite instructions to Moses and the children of Israel how this ark was to be treated. See, this symbolized the very presence of God. And this symbolizes the seriousness even of being in the presence of God. This, it shows even the seriousness of how we approach God. Turn with me to Numbers chapter 4. So put your finger in Second uh, Samuel 6. We'll come back to that very shortly. But let, let's see why this happened. So Numbers chapter 4, uh, verses 4 to 6. And what you see in verses 4 to 6 of Numbers 4 was it was the job of the Kohathites. And these were a particular clan of the Levites. And they were the only ones supposed to carry the holy things used in the worship of God. Verses 4 to 6 tells us that. That when the tabernacle was moved, the priests were to go and cover the Ark of the Covenant in goatskin and spread cloth upon it. So the Ark wasn't just meant to be out in public display for all to see. There were also rings around the Ark of the Covenant. Poles were meant to be placed in these. And that was how it was supposed to be carried. The ark wasn't just meant to be lifted and, and just manhandled by others. It was only supposed to be uh, by those poles. That's how they were supposed to lift it. And look at verse 15. Verse 15 of Numbers 4. It says this was to be carried by the Kohathites. It wasn't to be touched at all. This wasn't to be touched. It shows the seriousness even of doing this. They must not touch the holy things, verse 15, lest they die. Look down to verse 17 to 20 of Numbers 4. The Kohathites were not to go in or look on the holy things, lest they die. God gave them, you see, these rules for their own good. This was actually a measure of God's loving kindness. They actually warn them, be careful how you treat this ark. Be be careful how you even approach this. Because this symbolizes his presence. These rules were for their own good, to protect the people. Turn back to the second Samuel six. You know, and these rules were known by the Israelites. Yet in this instance it seems David and Uzzah and Ahio, who were clearly in charge of the transport, they this transport operation operation, they seemed to ignore these rules. They treated the ark lightly. And as we see, this is a dangerous thing to do. Uzzah had treated God's holiness lightly. They ignored God's word and they were judged by it. This was a lesson the Philistines and the people in Beth Shemesh learned in the hard way. Whenever the plagues even came upon them, even actually, sorry, in Beth Shemesh, uh, we see that when the ark was initially returned to them, it says that the people looked upon the ark and 70 people that day were struck down. They should have known this. It wasn't just the fact that this was written down in their law and the people didn't know. No, they would have known what had happened to Beth Shemesh. Actually, that 70 people were struck down just for looking at the ark. Others in the city, in 1 Samuel 6, 20, we read of that incident. Um, And 1 Samuel 6, it says in verse 20, Who is able to stand before the Lord, this holy God? You know how quickly people fail to learn from lessons in the past. And those who fail to learn from the lessons in the past are doomed to repeat them. God's holiness was not to be taken lightly. And Uzzah and David found that out the hard way. You know, we spoke a few weeks ago in Christianity Explored about God's wrath against sin. And a question was raised about how so many people today in our world prefer just to think of God as a God of love and and, and just stop there. And while God is a God of love, and certainly that's part of the picture, some people in our world today just prefer to have that view of God. That's the the, the God that they would like to believe in, that God is just a God of love, and it just stops there. 
God is a God of love, of course. He, he loved this world so much that he sent Jesus Christ, his son, into this world to give of his life for our sin. But his love is only part of the picture. He is also a holy God. One who does not take sin lightly. One, and we see that fact in the fact that in order to atone for sin, it would require the life of his very son in order to atone for it. That shows the seriousness of sin. That Christ bore the wrath of God. He bore God's judgment upon him for our sins. It's important that we see the full picture of who God is. That he's not only a God of love. He is a God of of wrath, wrath against sinners, against those who do not repent. He is a holy God. He is a just God. We need to see God for how scripture reveals him. You know, so many prefer to think of a God of their own image, in their own image. That just image of God of love, because they don't want to think about the fact that one day they're going to have to stand and give an account before a holy God. And yet God is also a gracious God. He has provided that way of salvation through Christ. We've just sung about that even in our our last song there. He shows mercy on those who repent. But other people make this mistake of of coming to this passage and say, well, isn't this just the God of the Old Testament? You know, the God of the Old Testament seems to do these things and strike people down. and, And they think, well, that's just for them. Well, let me remind you of the New Testament in Acts Acts 5, I think it is. Ananias and Sapphira. We see the holy God again striking down those who had sinned even before him. You know, it's important we see God as a holy God and and see that seriously. That we truly understand and comprehend the one who we approach. That we don't be, be flippant in any way about God. You know, the, the prayer, even the, the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, doesn't the Lord's prayer remind us of this? When it says, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. We live in a world that so often treats the name of the Lord so lightly. We live in a world like that where we hear people use the name of the Lord as a, as a swear word in the streets around us. We hear people even be flippant in the way they talk about God. But this should never be so of the Christian. We should never be flippant, even when we come before the holy God. Our lives even should be lived in a way that honor his holy name. You know, if we truly grasp God's holiness, then we would, we would tremble before him. I'm reminded of the illustration of, uh, in the C.S. Lewis book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And in those books, uh, he portrays Jesus as the lion, Aslan, in those books. And what happens is, early on in the books, uh, there's, there's, these, uh, uh, there's the characters who describe um, Aslan to the children. And here's what they say. If there's anyone who can appear before Aslan without their knees knocking, they're either braver than most or just silly. And the children ask, is Aslan, is he safe? Is he safe? And they reply, safe? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He isn't safe, but he's good. And that's what we see in 2 Samuel chapter chapters 5, even in 6. He's certainly not safe. He is a holy God, a powerful God, an almighty God. But he is good. He is a good God. He had warned his people about how to treat the ark. He did that in mercy. He did that in his kindness. He wanted them not to make this mistake. He wanted them to know exactly the one who they approach. He didn't want them to die. He wanted them to know of this. But yet they disregarded his word. And this is a sobering passage, isn't it? Because it reminds us that we must come to God in the way that he is appointed. We must not take it lightly, even about how we approach God. We must take his holiness seriously and even humble ourselves before him. But notice David's response, verses 8 to 9. How does David react to this? He reacts in anger. He's angry because the the Lord had broken out against Uzzah. You know, this was meant to be a great celebration, a mighty celebration. And now it had come to an abrupt end. 
God had given his people notice of what would happen. Numbers 4.15, that they would die if they would touch the holy things. This wrath was no outburst, but God settled wrath against sin. And the instruction was evidence of God's kindness. Maybe David was angry that God should have treated Uzzah in this way. Yet he had no right, David, to be angry against God. You know, because if we, we're, if we think that we're missing the great offense, even that our sin is against God. If we think of this, we're, we're missing actually that it is a great offense to go against God and his word. We miss the seriousness of sin. You know, that God cannot abide such a desecration of this. God is not one that we can mess with or treat lightly. And that lesson was one that the people didn't want to forget. So they named that place Perez Uzza, which means uh, your little uh, inscription in your margin might say this, bursting forth upon Uzza. They give that place a name so the people wouldn't forget that lesson. Don't treat God lightly. David wasn't just angry that day, but look, he has another reaction. Verse 9. He was afraid of the Lord because he says, how can the Lord come to me? After such a great demonstration of God's power, David is thinking, how are we going to bring the ark now into Jerusalem? And in his zeal to protect God's holiness and uh, his willingness, even to, as, as God would, would exercise his power against anyone who would break his law, David realized he couldn't treat the ark lightly. He couldn't treat the ark lightly. He can't manipulate God. He is a holy God. He is a consuming fire. And so David, aware of his own sinfulness, places the ark in the company of a man called Obed-Edom, the Gittite. Now, let's pause here for a wee moment. Obed-Edom, the Gittite. What is a, a Gittite? Where's a, a, who, who was a Gittite? Where was he from? A Gittite was the name given to someone who came from Gath. Now, why is that significant? Gath, have we think back to the, the story of David. David had connections with Gath, you see. And what was Gath? It was actually a Philistine city. It was actually a Philistine city. And David at one stage even allied himself to a Philistine king called Achish. He actually worked with them as well at one time. And 600 of these Gittites from Gath actually came in David's army one time. So Obed-Edom wasn't a Jewish name. This man was a Gentile. So instead of bringing the plagues in Obed-Edom's house, God blesses Obed-Edom for as the ark even being there. And so the ark remained there for three months and he and his house is blessed. Do you know, it's good for us to have this proper reverence of God, but that's only part of the story because we're also called to love him and trust him. And when we do this, we are truly blessed. See, three months on, David realizes, look what I've missed out on. Three months on, here's this man has been blessed. And while David was in fear, while David was in reverence, David realized he had to do things in God's way in order to be truly blessed by him. And so the last thing we see here is in verses 12 to 23. Because there is a celebration in the joy of the Lord. He wasn't just to give, give uh, reverence to the Lord and to, to fear the Lord, to treat him rightfully. He was also to be rejoicing in him because once David hears of this blessing, this spurs him into action. And the blessing of Obed-Edom maybe reminds him of the hope of being able to retrieve it once again. But what a transformed David. And I want you to notice the difference here in these verses. Instead, David goes to Obed-Edom's house with rejoicing. Verse 13 uh, as David's learned from his painful lesson. Notice how it says they transported the ark. It says those who bore the ark. Now what does that indicate? It indicates when it talks about those who buried the ark, the people bore the ark. Likely David is giving the Levites to, to transport it as they should using those poles, not touching the ark, rather than using the cart. And, and that's not the only precaution David took. Six steps in, they pause. A sacrifice of an ox and a fattened animal and a calf is offered. So David's asked, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? I don't know about you, but this reminds me of the psalm. Psalm 24, verses 3 to 4. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, and he doesn't lift his soul up to what is false or swear deceitfully. 
Do you know what are high standards? What high standards? Perfect standards. Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? Only those with a clean heart. Only those with a pure heart. You know, God has high standards. He is perfect. He is perfectly holy. But God made provision that people could come and be accepted by him. He gave them a way of atonement. And in the Old Testament times, that was through the sacrificial offering of an animal. Without blood being shed, there was no remission of sins. And so David realizes this question that he asked before, how could the ark come to me? Well, the only way is if atonement is made. These sacrifices, of course, point to Christ's greater sacrifice. The one who is the perfect offering for our sin. And so David, in order to make this sacrifice, was determined that there would be nothing that would hinder even God's presence being among them. And so David rejoiced. And we have this scene of David dancing before the Lord. And he he sheds his royal robes and uh, is just clothed in this linen ephod. That's all he has on. Similar to the kind of garments even that a a priest would have worn at the time. And, And what a joyous celebration it was. As the ark came to Jerusalem with triumph, there were shouts. There was a sounding of the horn. It was like a, it was like a victory parade. And yet not everyone was rejoicing on this occasion. As the ark's coming into the city, Michael, the daughter of Saul, verses 16, looks out the windows and sees David leaping and dancing before the Lord. And she despises him in her heart. The rest are rejoicing. All these people are rejoicing and she despises David in her heart. The words indicate that as David was dancing around, the word word in Hebrew means he was literally whirling around, caught up in the joy and delight in worshiping the Lord. Now, let me say, this isn't advocating an, an approach in, in worship. Uh, I often have to say as we're getting ready for the last hymn. But, you know, this isn't recommended practice in the church. You don't really find this in, in the New Testament, you know, about the, the early church doing this. But, but David's caught up in this moment with great joy. Such is the joy in his heart. He's dancing and he's not worried if anyone's watching him. Notice how repeatedly that the writer doesn't want us to forget. Notice how here the writer refers to Michael. Look at these verses from uh, verses uh, 20 onwards. Or even, even, 19, uh, sorry, even 16 onwards. How is Michael referred to every time? It doesn't just say Michael. It says Michael, the daughter of Saul. Now, that's actually very significant because when anyone repeats something often in Scripture, the writer's emphasizing something here for us. And here we see that here Michael resembles Saul, doesn't she? In terms of how she reacts to even God. Because in this occasion, she resembles her father's own lack of spirituality. She resembles his hardness of heart. Because instead of rejoicing, she's only bitter. She is bitter and hardened against the true, joyful celebration of what's happening here. See, God's presence, the thing that represented God's presence, was coming into the city. People should be rejoicing. It was going to reside in the tabernacle, and and those right offerings were being restored. David was joyful. He was handing out food even to the people as well, too, just so it all could celebrate in the joy. But here, Michael was bitter. Now, you might say to yourself, well, Actually, now I can kind of sympathize with Michael a, a little bit because Michael had actually been through a very difficult time. Michael had been through a lot. She'd lost her father, Saul. She'd lost her brothers. Three of the brothers were killed in battle with Saul. Not only that, her remaining brother, Ishbosheth, remember what happened to him? He's got assassinated. So she, none of her family left. She was also then, last week, uh, the previous week, used as a pawn and and to bring this peace between Abner and David. Here was this woman used as a pawn and her her second husband's left weeping behind her as she she goes back to David. She had grown bitter and she'd let this bitterness even blind her to God's glory. She became her own worst enemy because it seems her royal dignity was all she had left. And all she could think of when David arrives home, well, what words uh, greet him? Words of scorn, words of sarcasm. Look what she said. Look at how the king of Israel honored himself today. In other words, David, look at yourself. 
You were dancing around with your ephod on, half naked before your royal servants. Instead of, you know, he should have been clothed, she thought, in his royal robes. And here he was dancing in such a way that, you know, had he no shame? She was implying even that he was somehow behaving immorally here. The question is, was she exaggerating these these charges? Maybe. Maybe. David, now notice how he replies, I didn't dance before the servants, I danced before the Lord. The one who chose me above your father and all his house. I don't know about you, but if we'd have heard this argument when David said those last words, uh, I danced before the Lord, the one who chose me above your father. I don't know about you, but the crowd would have been going, oh, as David said those words, how those words must have cut their heart. But they were true. God had chosen David to be his king, his prince over Israel the people of the Lord. And David says, I'll celebrate before the Lord. David didn't care what Michael thought. He says, if you may be embarrassed by this, well, I'll make myself even more more contemptible than this, so long as I do it before the Lord. In other words, Michael, it doesn't matter what you think. What matters is what God thinks. I'll be honored, he says, for my humility before the Lord. He danced before God to, to celebrate and give thanks. And Michael was actually not just rejecting David here. She was rejecting the Lord. Michael could not see what was happening that day. In her bitterness, it had hardened her heart about the true significance of what was happening. God's presence was among his people. The rightful worship and the reconciliation was going to be restored again. But yet Michael's only worried about a breach of decorum. And so the last thing, read verse 23. She had no child in the day of her death. You know, some writers speculate, is this God's judgment upon her? Or maybe it was simply a, a rift that had been caused between her and David that day and had never been repaired. Yet because of Michael's attitude, what we see is here in verse 23, it may not seem significant as you read it, but it is. Because actually, here is the door closed on the final remnant of Saul's reign. Michael is the only real remnant of Saul's reign left and now the door's closed in that. Now the way is open for God's covenant with David. And as we close today, what are we to take away from a passage like this? You know, in this passage, we can really see two errors about approaching God. The first is people can either treat God's holiness casually And when I say treat God's holiness casually, I'm not talking about dress. I'm talking about the attitude of our heart. The attitude of our heart. I'm referring about how do we approach God, either in the things we say in our prayer, in our prayers, or even in the way we live. Even when we spend that time with God in our quiet time. Do we remember the one who we come before? The one who we worship? or, Or do we just go through the motions? Or what about how we live? Are we content to turn a blind eye to our sin? Because that's not how God sees it. We come and we serve a holy God. So there can be an error of, of coming before God too casually. The second error is we can come too coldly to God as well too. Like if we ever get too caught up in being so formal if, that we get offended if things are done in a slightly different manner than we're used to. I remember some years ago preaching in a church which remained nameless. And this church, I remember I was there as a student. And what I'd done is uh, before the table, we, we sung a hymn and I, I changed the order of the hymn and the prayer. And at the door, you'd, there was a couple of people going, that was so different this morning. That was so different. And I was like, what, what was different? Apparently they were used to doing things in slightly different order the way the prayer and the hymn was. For some people it was like, oh, this this was was revolutionary. And I thought to myself, how sad that they become so formal in in worship. And maybe we are so used to if if things are done in a certain pattern that we we sing them, we pray. And and what if we did start off with three songs? That would be okay too. There'd be nothing wrong in that. We do that sometimes on a Sunday night as well. We haven't always to do the the things in that certain pattern. But some can get so caught up in the formalism that, you know, that we fail to actually be moved by God's presence. 
that we fail to realize what we're doing here. We sometimes maybe can forget, even in our lives, that we're supposed to delight in the Lord. We're supposed to delight in him. That's what God's word tells us again and again. We're meant to enjoy the Lord. You know, isn't there a lesson for us here? That we're not to be too casual about we, how we approach the Lord, but to remember we come before a holy God. And so we need to examine the attitude of our hearts. But also, is the attitude of our hearts cold before God? Do we just sing the words without really thinking what we're singing? We have a God who is holy. A God who is meant to be enjoyed and delighted in. But we have a God who is gracious. Gracious to forgive us our sins. And that's the thing we see here. If maybe we need to correct our attitude before God. He is a God who is gracious even in forgiveness. Doesn't the life of David show us that? Of a man who even sinned before the Lord. But yet God forgave him and was able to use him. And God can use us too. And so in a moment, we're going to sing this hymn, Grace Greater Than Our Sin. But before that, let us close in uh, the first part of our service in prayer. And then after that, we're going to sing this hymn and then we're going to meet around the table. We're continuing our worship that way. So let's pray first of all. Heavenly Father, we do want to give you thanks, Lord, of how your word reveals yourself for who you are, that you are a holy God. A God who is just. And, and as we see us as sin, help us to realize that for what it was, that it was sin. That they were treating God's holiness lightly. And Father, may that cause us to examine our hearts that we may never be casual just about how we even live before you in our lives. Lest we forget that you are a holy God. Help us to remember, Lord, even in our lives that we are meant to be holy and acceptable living sacrifices for you. Help us also, Lord, not to grow cold about our worship. Help us, Lord, to enjoy you and delight in your word. Father, just restore even unto us the joy of our salvation if it has grown cold. And so, Lord, speak to us today, but you are also a gracious God and you've given that way of forgiveness that one through whom we can find forgiveness through Christ Jesus. And as our next hymn reminds us of that, Lord, speak to our hearts today and bless us even as we continue our worship now and meet around the table in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's just stay seated as we sing the next hymn, please. Grace greater than our sin.
Please turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. I want to begin by reading a few verses from verse 22. I actually want to refer to a few verses near the end of this passage, but I want to just read these by way of introduction. We've mentioned verses 22 to 24 previously, but uh, I want to refer to some other verses today. So Hebrews 12, beginning to read at verse 22 to 24, just to get the setting here. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels and festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks of a better word than the blood of Abel. And then look down to Hebrews 12, verse 28 to 29. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And let us thus offer to God our acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. You know, this chapter in the book of Hebrews reminds us that we come to a greater Jerusalem. I have, do you want me to actually go to that point? Sorry, I have some issues with the sound here, so. We'll come right to here. I'm a bit of a sin, even a bit having a bit of change. There we are. There's, there's the words put into practice this morning. Well, you know, this passage here in the book of Hebrews reminds us that we come to a greater Jerusalem a heavenly Jerusalem, to a place of even greater worship. And verses 22 to 24 reminds us of this. It's a place where innumerable angels will gather, also those whose names are in heaven. And also it reminds us that though the one through whom we approach is Jesus, described here as the mediator of this new and better covenant, which he purchased through the shedding of his precious blood. But it also reminds us as we go on in these verses that we too will be a part of a greater kingdom, one that will never be shaken. Though Satan and his powers have tried to oppose even the building of God's kingdom for years, for thousands of years, we see this kingdom has not been shaken. Many more souls continue to be added to it today. God is still building his church. And it reminds us in these verses that actually that kingdom will remain. That kingdom will not be shaken. But those verses in verses 28 to 29 reminds us of our worship before the Lord. How do we come before we worship the Lord? It tells us to come and says what acceptable worship is. Come with reverence. We approach an almighty and powerful God, a holy God, the one who once even judged the whole earth with a flood. That reminds us of the soberness of God's judgment even against sin. The one who by power of his voice, in verses 26 to 27 of these, it says, by the power of his voice, he can shake even the very earth and the heavens. His kingdom will stand. Do you know, when you think about it, people today, we often think we live in ourselves in in a very technological age, and often the world is very proud of their technological achievements. But when you think of it, God has often reminded us repeatedly who's in control. He reminds us of his power through his creation, through the power of a tsunami or a a hurricane, or even some years ago. You know, we've uh, made tremendous advances, even in flight, of course, haven't we? Some of these great airliners, but yet weren't they all grounded a number of years ago through a volcano erupting? And no matter how great the technology was, they weren't able to get those flights off the ground, I think, for a period of weeks. Or what about through a simple virus, even how God brought the world even to its knees? You know, God controls all things. He is holy, and we should never approach him lightly. We come with reverence. We come also with awe. Because what a wonder that the Almighty God would choose to reveal himself to creation. To his crea- through his creation, he reveals himself. He gives us a way that we can approach him even through Christ and his sacrifice. And what a wonder that through faith we can call him Father, that we can even come into his presence, in his presence of the Holy God. What a wonder that is. We should come with reverence. We should come with awe. And our God, he is a consuming fire. He won't accept divided loyalty. 
but rather people who are wholly devoted to him. And that's humbling. As we come around the table, we would do well to remember that this is no mere routine we go through. This is an important time of thanksgiving, a time of remembrance, a time of even expression of our fellowship, but it is an act of worship and we should never treat this thoughtlessly or lightly. I often read from 1 Corinthians 11, as I will shortly, but we sometimes don't read what comes after that passage. It says, Whoever therefore eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. So then each should examine themselves, when we eat, lest we eat or drink judgment upon ourselves. In Corinthians, some had even uh, grown, grown weak and ill through treating the Lord's table lately. Some had even died as well too. They'd failed to revere God's holiness. They'd made the same mistake that Uzza did. So as we come around the table, let us not make that mistake. Let us examine our hearts in these moments of quietness to confess even our own sin and come before him with reverence and awe. For those who repent and seek his mercy, they will find it. Praise God that his grace is indeed greater than our sin. The Lord Jesus, on the night in which he is betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant on my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. What a friend we have in Jesus. Our Father, we come into your holy presence the only way we can through the lovely name of our Lord Jesus. And as we come to take the bread, we remember what it cost you, the Holy One. Lord, how that body was marred upon all recognition. And Lord, we just want to give you thanks in your precious name. Amen. Lord Jesus, as we gather here on no Sunday morning around your table spread, we give you thanks. Lord Jesus, we give you thanks for the help, the strength, and the able us to gather here together as believers. Lord Jesus, we give you thanks for this finished work upon you, the cross. Lord Jesus, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for loving me. You went to Calvary, and there you died for me. Thank you, Lord for loving me. You rose up from the grave, a new life you gave. 
Thank you, Lord, for loving me. Lord Jesus, we give you thanks for this cup, this token of your spoke blood. We give you thanks for your finished work upon the cross. And Lord, we look forward to your coming again. For it's in Jesus' name. Amen. Heavenly Father, we do want to thank you, even that in your word you do reveal yourself. You show us, Lord, even how we are to approach you. Lord, we marvel at the fact that we can call you our Father, our Heavenly Father. And Father, we long that your name would be hallowed in our lives. We long also that name would be hallowed even in the lives of others, even in our world around us that they would see of even evidence of who you are, even through us. And Father, we want to give you thanks that you gave us that way of atonement, the one who, who reconciled us to you, Lord, even through his atoning death on the cross. Father, we want to thank, give you thanks for that. And as these emblems have once again reminded us, Lord, help us never to forget that. Help us never to forget the one who we do approach. And so, Lord, even as we leave here tonight and as we we gather in tonight again on Christianity Explored and as we consider even of your grace, Lord, we ask that we'd even be blessed in our time together. In Jesus' name, amen.